Good afternoon, welcome to the Academy of Physical Medicine once again, another of our lunchtime CPD sessions. Uh, today we're going to be talking a bit about philosophy and history and how different principles cross different disciplines. And I'm joined by Robert Cartwright, who not only was an old clinic tutor of mine, but also was my principal at one stage when I worked in his clinic. And Robert, it's great to have you with us. Hi Steve, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right, thanks. Good. I gather you're, uh, you shut down early in your clinic, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, you were saying yesterday. I did, yeah. I shut down a week before the uh, statutory instrument uh, uh, was, was applied because uh, I spent a lot of time with my uh, elderly father. So we've right. been off work for quite a long time now. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I've had a few emails today from people who were just commenting on, you know, what the hell can we do? It's, uh, it's getting more and more difficult with uh, the lack of income, quite apart from anything else. Yeah. I'm wondering how the latest uh, government guidelines, if one can call them that, affect uh, opening clinics. And of course they don't, they don't change the, the guidance for us. And certainly for people like yourself, when you've got a vulnerable parent. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. yeah, it makes it difficult, doesn't it? Anyway, we're going to talk about classical osteopathy today. And yeah. um, I'm an osteopath that you trained originally as a bog standard osteopath, if I can use that expression. Um, what led you into classical osteopathy? Well, I, I don't know if you remember when, uh, or whether they were still there when uh, you trained at the College of Osteopaths, Steve. But, uh, um, we had lecturers who came from the Maidstone School, which was John Wernham's college. Uh, yes. who, uh, it was John Wernham and T.E. Hall who set up the Institute of Classical Osteopathy, which was originally called something else, which I will kind of come back to in a minute. And so we shared some of the lecturers with them. So we, I had a kind of exposure to classical osteopathy as an undergraduate. Um, and, and I enjoyed the intri intricacy of it and the detail. But uh, when you're an undergraduate, you kind of just want to get through, really, don't you? And uh, uh, I, I, I uh, enjoyed it, but uh, I carried on working as I'd been taught. So we had a bit of a mix of some of the College of Osteopaths uh, graduates as lecturers, quite a few BSO lecturers, and the odd person from uh, the Maidstone School. And I, I, I don't know if you did the naturopathy diploma. No. Carrot, Steve, did you do that? No, I didn't. Okay, okay. And so you could do that in tandem with the... Uh, uh, with the DO at, at that time. And when, when I qualified in uh, 1997, I started working, also started working at the Osteopathic Centre for Children. Uh, and then in that new academic year, I started training to, uh, as an acupuncturist, which was uh, at the British College of Acupuncture doing a three year sort of part time course. So I kind of was pretty busy and uh, I, I sort of forgot about classical osteopathy for a while because I was practicing osteopathy that I'd you know, recently graduated in and the acupuncture and was coming on and uh, doing naturopathy and uh, I had a busy successful clinic and I also worked as a clinic tutor as you just mentioned for five years uh, after I graduated up until 2002. But after a while I kind of stopped doing the naturopathy that I'd been taught and, and I worked in a very MSK uh, fashion uh, and, and would use a local medical osteopath uh, uh, for cortisone injections and that sort of thing, facet joint injections and epidurals when, when I kind of required that. And that was quite a common thing, me sending people over, over, over to this guy. And he, you know, he worked privately or, or we would send them back through uh, you know, an NHS referral via their, via their GP. Um, so I, because, because of that, I'd, I'd had a few glimpses of uh, uh, what osteopathy was supposed to do. Um, rather than just treat musculoskeletal uh, pain. And one of, one of them was uh, uh, a chap who I saw who had angina, and uh, he came in with upper back and neck pain. And when we resolved that, his angina went. And uh, another one, uh, there was a chap that had a, uh, it hyperextended his neck in a motocross accident, and he came in complaining of headaches, and he partially lost the sight in his one of his eyes after that as well. And funnily enough, I said, well, I don't think I can do anything about your eye, but I might be able to help with your headaches. And he came back the following week and his, his eye was better, but it was, his, his eye had cleared up and uh, he could see probably out of his eye, which was fantastic, but his headaches were really better. So I had that kind of completely wrong, which was uh, kind of amusing. There's, um, it raises a question for me. I, mean, I spent yesterday teaching a, a first aid course, and of course angina figures in that, and we talk about the mechanism for angina as opposed to myocardial infarction. Um, I'm struggling um, in a very um, interested way, not in a critical way, but I'm struggling to understand how a, how a narrowed um, 
coronary artery can be cleared up through any form of osteopathy? Well, it's mainly to do with vasoconstriction. And uh, because your coronary arteries are controlled by your, the, the lumen is controlled by uh, um, your nervous system, right? You know, and that's done on demand to uh, like exercise, for example. And so your heart can work harder. And uh, what had happened to this chap's upper back, and he had a whiplash injury, I remember rightly. It was quite a long time ago. And he was in his 70s and he started getting chest pains after that. And he was diagnosed as having a, um, angina, and he was given a uh, trinitrate spray. When and so, whenever he had the pain in his chest, he squirted that under his tongue, and uh, and uh, away he went again. And uh, after this, he didn't have to use his trinitrate spray anymore. Interesting, yeah, because that is a vasodilator. So if you can dilate the um, the arteries some other way, then you know, you're achieving yeah. the necessary effect, aren't you? Well, if you think, yeah. if you think, wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't have occurred to me. That's, that's how that's how funneled it. my vision is. <laughs> that's all right. I mean, one one of the things about classical osteopathy is we do think about the autonomic nervous system a lot more. You know, because yeah. I, I've, and, and you know, did you did you ever wonder why we had to learn about that as undergraduates, and then when you got into practice or were working in clinic, um, you, it didn't really come in, <laughs> come into use much. You know, and, and yeah, I must admit, as an undergraduate, I did sometimes wonder whether they were teaching us stuff just so that we could appear to know all the stuff that our medical, conventional medical counterparts would know. Um, in other words, to give us a status yeah. without it being yeah. relevant, because yeah. so much of it as an undergraduate was about the musculoskeletal. It uh, is, it stuff. is, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I just ask you about classical osteopathy again, though, because um, the minute someone puts the title classical into something, you think, okay, that means that they're taking us back to the roots because they believe that the roots are the be all and end all. And I have a slight, um, I, I have a slight question mark in my mind over whether we should accept everything that Andrew Taylor, still the founder of osteopathy, uh, said, because of course he didn't have the access to all the information that we now have, and I'm sure that he would have developed his thinking with the, with the benefit of this information. So yeah, you're, not taking us back, you're not taking us back simply no. to it. So if Andrew no. Taylor still didn't do it, then it's not right. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely not. I mean, that is one of the things I think that people think about uh, classical osteopathy. And uh, uh, after John Martin Littlejohn went to uh, Kirksville, and Andrew Taylor still probably saved his life there. You know, he devoted his life to studying osteopathy. Uh, John Martin Littlejohn was an extremely intelligent, scholastic guy, and he put a huge amount of uh, uh, physiology into it. And people have often said, you know, other um, researchers have often said that, you know, he was 50 to 100 years ahead of his time. So he, he wrote a physiology book as well, which, uh, and, and of course, 100 years ago, every, not everything was right. And so, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we can say, actually, yes, yeah, so that wasn't entirely right. Um, but it doesn't always make a difference to how you're working at the cold, clinical cold face. But it, what it does make a difference to is your understanding of it. Right. OK. So we do, we do use, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, pain science. I really enjoyed that talk you had last week. Oh, oh, Ulrich. Ulrich, Ulrich Sandstrom. Ulrich, yeah, that's really good. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah, so was, you know, so we incorporate that into this and in, it, in fact it wasn't called pain science back then but when John Martin Littlejohn wrote a book in about 1910 he uh he incorporated um stuff that they use in pain science you know so uh he, he was way ahead of his time like, like for example the lymphatic system which was discovered recently he said that there was lymphatics in the brain and that um other paper about the uh the the neurology around the heart which was discovered uh, not that long ago uh, he he talked about that, and also the abdominal brain, which was uh, uh, so, so. So sometimes you do. You yeah, well, do he, but he can't have been right, Robert, not unless he'd done a randomised control study. No, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and of course, there isn't much of that these days. You know, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, research is always really, really important. I, I I'm a, a big fan of research. Uh, I I re uh, work as a an unpaid job as a reviewer for one of the journals, uh, which I enjoy doing. And, uh, uh, not just one of the journals, the Journal of Body Work and Movement Therapy, or the other way around. Um, right, Leon yeah. Chato's, yeah. uh, late yeah. Leon Chato's journal, yeah. um, closely connected, connected with Matt Walden as well, who's another one of our uh, yes. very popular speakers. Yeah, 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 lovely, lovely chat, Matt. And yeah. uh, so, so, you know, it's, but the, we, we do have a dearth of research uh, across all aspects of uh, manual therapy, unfortunately. And, uh, um, you know, it's something we do need to work on. But having said that, you know, the, the, the medics, uh, I think there was this paper in PLOS Medicine a few years ago, and it was only something like 15% of uh, their treatments uh, 
a, a evidence base to actually support what they're doing. So it's not only us, yeah. um, but uh, you know, we, we do have to take note of research and try and do research. We are actually uh, um, trying to um, take a research project forward at the moment where we uh, are, are able to look at people with non-MSK cases and, and compare them. It's a relatively basic, um, low level of, of uh, uh, research evidence, but you, you know, you have to start somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Is, there a, um, is there a typical approach in classical osteopathy which would differ to that of a, a standard osteopath or yeah, maybe yeah, chiropractic? Is, is. A, lot, a lot of that is actually in the thinking, though. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's how you're thinking. It is a principle based um, strategy uh, to osteopathy rather than being more of a technique based uh, strategy. Um, yeah. I, I came to it really because after I'd done about 40 or 45,000 treatments working uh, as in this way I had learnt at undergraduate college and doing various other technique courses, you know, like the acupuncture and, and that sort of thing, did some Laurie Hartman weekends and all the minimal leverage stuff and that sort of thing. But I, by, after I'd done about 40, 45,000 treatments, I was, I was starting to wonder whether I was actually helping people uh, or not. And a lot of people I did, but there was some groups of people I was... I was quite bothered about because they would just gradually get worse. And these are the people who would often end up needing, you know, a, a month on anti-inflammatories or uh, um, and being a natu naturopath, I never liked that, um, uh, or facet joint injections or, or eventually surgery. So I was quite concerned about these people. And I, I've always been quite reflective about my work. And, and of course, we, we all want the best for the people who, who come and see us. And uh, what, what it appeared to me, you know, the osteopathy, the osteopathy that I'd been taught, or it might have been the osteopathy that I'd learnt rather than, than I'd been taught, it, it didn't do what Andrew Taylor Still's uh, work did. You know, his work seemed to be uh, much more constitutional rather than MSK orientated. So he'd take people in and, you know, they'd stay at Kirksville for a while, which could well have been one of the reasons why they got better. Um, but, uh, but also, you know, they, they would recover from all sorts of uh, illnesses, which, uh, you know, we, we're not treating people for, for those kind of things today, which is, you know, is, is, is appropriate mm -hmm. in a lot of places, places. But the few results, the few non-MSK results that, uh, that I saw were, you know, they, I, I didn't do them on purpose. They were, they were accidents, you know, and so uh, that kind of kept my brain working on it. And then I, I was sort of uh, by chance on an online forum uh, called Osteopathy for All, run by Jody Jacob. I don't know if you know him. Ever such an large no. chap. The American guy lives in Portugal. And uh, he, this this chap who was uh, from the classical school, he was able to explain to me why, you know, the, 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 why I was having the problems that I was having. And he said, well, you know, because you're looking at the spine in this particular way, you know, you're what you're actually doing is you're palliating a collapsing structure. So whereas initially your patient will get better, but as the further he goes down the line, you know, it's going to get harder and harder to, to treat him. And that, that's exactly what I was, I was found. That's, that's exactly what I, I found. So I went on and did the uh, classical Institute of Classical Osteopathy pathway, and uh, which is they have three, three courses. So you do a foundation course, and then you could do an applied course, and then their advanced course. And so after that, I, I just work as a, uh, a classical osteopath, yeah. uh, and, and what I've been, what I've found is that I'm able to help more people more of the time, and because it's a constitutional approach, as well as their MSK uh, stuff getting better, sometimes other symptoms of other uh, conditions that they have in, have improved as well, and that can be uh, quite common. So, so uh, which makes our work even more rewarding than it, than it is anyway, because you know it's. Uh, it's it's, uh, and it made me feel more like a, a proper osteopath. <laughs> Some time ago, and I'm going to go on a limb here and expose my complete and utter ignorance, but having been my tutor at college for some time, you'll realise that I'm full of ignorance. Um, I once uh, was, I was chatting to a classical osteopath, and they were talking me around their treatment approach. And their treatment approach at, in this particular instance was um, to treat the whole body and then just to concentrate on the areas of the body where they found that there was, they perceived that there was a problem. Um, and that may have been through articulation, through harmonics, through um, uh, spinal adjustments or whatever else. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that is a particularly classical approach or not. I, I came away with the impression that it was. 
And I was struck by when I was talking to some McTimony chiropractors at their annual conference, how that was the approach that they took as well. And I'm always keen to look for these sort of crossovers between osteopathy and chiropractic. And, uh, and there is a little bit of a crossover, isn't there? Because um, the founder of chiropractic actually studied with uh, Little John and um, uh, still Nick. Yeah, you're, you're probably putting a lot of chiropractors' blood pressure up at the moment saying that. <laughs> no, I'm not, yeah, saying, I'm not yeah. saying that they're doing, that we taught them everything they <laughs> know. Yeah, there's a lot of conflict about that. And, and why does it really matter? It doesn't really, you know. Uh, I, I think both both uh, Didi Palmer and A.T. Steele discovered that there was a somatic component, or sometimes, not all the time, there was a somatic component uh, to people's ability to be able to recover. Uh, yeah. So therefore... Uh, helping people get over that somatic uh, component, they sometimes are able to recover from other things. But within classical, classical osteopathy, we do use a, a thing which is now called BA, or body adjustment. And so we look at the uh, uh, someone's structure, uh, you know, in a standing posture, much like you were taught to do at undergraduate level. But there's uh, uh, those those uh, polygons of forces uh, diagram I sent you over. I don't know if you want to just... Well, yeah, we, we can bring them up. And I know you don't want to go through them in huge detail because, of course, uh, the, the text is quite complicated. Yeah. Um, we uh, we will make your original uh, documents available to the audience yeah, to download, right, if that's yeah. okay, which yeah. has an explanation yeah. of all these. But if you could just run us through. This one's yeah. your anterior-posterior gravity line. Right? Yeah, so this is... Uh, this, this, what, oh, no, it's all gone there. Ah, here we go. So, yes, so what we do is we tend to look at someone's structure and look how it would be most ideally related to uh, or balanced with gravity. And then you can draw lines through that. And these are force lines, so that where it goes through the thoracic spine, the spine there, it represents uh, uh, compression. And where it goes through the back of the lumbar spine, it, it, it also uh, is, is partly a sort of line of tension. And it, it just joins things together, so you can look at the whole structure in terms of how gravity affects it. So what we do is we look at someone's structure and see the configuration they're in and then try and guide them back to a better relationship with gravity. And so BA is always a, a, a whole body treatment. Having said that, sometimes it isn't because in the, if people are sick and you're doing something like a bedside treatment, Mervyn Waldman is superb on this and there's, we have quite a few videos of him doing bedside treatment. He works in a hospital in, in Israel doing this kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, he's very well worth watching, but doing a, to a, a full treatment, which should last about 20, 25 minutes, is too exhausting for someone who's uh, um, acutely ill. Or with someone who is in severe pain, you know, you've got someone with an acute disc, you're not going to lie them on, your, on their back and then on, on their front and leave them there while you go through a whole treatment. It'd be wonderful if you could, but, you, you know, you'll have them stuck there on the treatment table if you try and do that. Um, so you have to... You know, you have to be able to work around that and get someone comfortable enough to then uh, take them through a BA. And the BA is really just a tool. Our approach isn't only a biomechanical uh, approach. You know, what is very big these days and uh, uh, what uh, people like um, classical osteopathy tend to be criticised for is, is the fact that people think it is just a biomechanical model. So we look at the structure and... Uh, wiggle the arms and legs around a bit, pull this way a bit and pull that way a little bit, and then they, you know, they have a better balance of gravity. And that's not really considering the higher centres, their diet and their beliefs. But it, it, again, going back to the historical component of this, um, back in 1910, in, on, the, on the first page of uh, Little John's 400 odd page tome on the principles of osteopathy, he says Oste the principle of osteopathy is adjustment. And that adjustment isn't, you know, HVT, someone's sacroiliac joint and making it crack. It's, it's making an adjustment so hopefully their health or wellness improves, you know. So that adjustment could be talking to them about their beliefs um, or their, uh, their diet, uh, you know. So it, it takes in all the psychosocial problems that, uh, you know, we're aware of today. So e even though people think uh, the biopsychosocial movement started with Engel in 1980, you know, uh, uh, John Martin, Little John, and the early osteopaths, a lot of them were doing it back in the, the turn of the 20th century. Well, we've got a few questions in, Robert, if, if I may interrupt. Um, John in, has sent one in asking if you could explain basically the difference between classical and conventional osteopathy. And I'm guessing he's not an osteopath because um, he says, well, what, you know, what exactly are they? How do they differ? What is it that um, sets them apart? 
Well, I think modern osteopathy, uh, uh, even though at undergraduate level people are taught principles, they're very quickly forgotten in clinic. So what people learn in clinic is more screening for disease and then treating MSK function. You know, we, we still screen for disease, but then we treat the whole person as, a, as an individual. And I'm not saying a lot of osteopaths don't do that, but we do it from this principle-based position, uh, which is what um, Andrew Taylor still, is, uh, well, he actually said it was a philosophy, and then uh, his graduates put principles behind it to try and simplify it, I think, a little bit. Not that it's ever been simple. Um, so we tend to treat from this principle-based uh, approach. So uh, things like the body is a unit, the body contains uh, the ability to heal itself given the right environment. Uh, the, the rule of the artery is supreme, which is a, a very old one, which has kind of been taken out uh, really, but that's the rule of the artery is about uh, any area that uh, has poor blood supply will uh, then become diseased and that's you know, relatively obvious. And so mm. tissue health is dependent on uh, good blood supply, good nerve supply, good venous and lymphatic drainage. So we, we look at that and then we if we see an area which is how, that's compromised and you've got some uh, uh, microvascular and neural compromise, we'll look at the areas which control that and try and see why that bit um, is functioning as it is. And then we look at, interpret that in relation to the whole structure. Um, say, for instance, that's a somatic dysfunction somewhere. We try and get behind why that somatic dysfunction is there, uh, rather than saying, oh, he's got a problem with, H with L3, let's HVT it. We look at the whole structure and ask why that uh, uh, somatic dysfunction is there and try and deal with those uh, uh, issues, which we do by using the tool BA, which we use long lever articulation for, and to try and improve arch mechanics and improve the integration of the structure so yeah. that it generally works better. We've apparently had lots of requests for you to explain what you were talking about earlier on when you said um, the recently discovered lymphatics. Yeah, the lymphatic, lymphatic system of the brain. Uh, that was, uh, when was that discovered? Probably about 2017, something like that. You, you tell me, Robert. <laughs> so any, anyway, you know, that, that, that was, uh, 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 and every now and then anatomists make these new discoveries, don't they? Something they didn't think was there before. But uh, uh, John Martin Littlejohn um, wrote that there were lymphatics in, in the brain. And uh, so sometimes when people write these things and we think, oh, it's, uh, that, you know, we know that's not there. And then sometimes 100 years later, people find that they actually are there. You know, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's important to keep up to date with these things. But it's also important not to throw out some of the old information that we can still use. That leads us nicely on to a question from Jonathan Hearsey. Jonathan was one of our speakers uh, a week or so ago, and, um, and I think this is a very personal question, and it's not meant in any way to be critical or malicious, as he points out. He asks what you say to people who feel that our professions, chiropractic and osteopathy, uh, risk their own existence by focusing on deceased leaders. We don't focus on deceased le leaders. You know, but uh, osteopathy was a principle-based uh, um, philosophy which uh, worked on principles. And uh, we believe that uh, um, using their uh, principles is still as valid and relevant as it was today because physiology hasn't changed, and anatomy hasn't changed, it's just our understanding of it is, is better. But we don't uh, only look at uh, uh, Little John's work. You know, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Frank Willard. And uh, I, maybe some people would say that he's, he's not, not in date anymore, but at least he's still alive. You know, I can email <laughs> Frank Willard and, and ask him a question. So it, it's, we're, we're not only looking at uh, Little John and Stills work. We're, lo we're looking at, uh, we're using some of their work as an example or as a, as a foundation uh, to build from there. I think I can understand where Jonathan's uh, coming from with that, though, because uh, sometimes... I feel it's possible that when people say, ah, oh, well, Andrew Taylor still said this, it, it begins to sound almost like a religious cult, but yeah, because yeah. he said it, it must be true. Well, of course, it was true in, on the basis of what he understood in his day. Yeah, 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 a a absolutely. I remember um, having lectures 
uh, again, when I was undergraduate, from the Maidstone people, and they'd say, Mr. Worman says this, or Mr. Wernham says that, you know, and, uh, and bearing in mind he had been in practice for 70 years, I mean, he might have done, not done a lot of research, but he'd done a hell of a lot of observation, and he had a hell of a lot of anecdotal research uh, behind him, and he had read a lot, you know, so uh, I, I think uh, I would much rather listen to someone who's been practicing for uh, 70 years than someone who's been practicing for two years you know, in terms of uh, their uh, experience is concerned. <laughs> yes, yeah. And uh, Gemma sent in uh, an observation that she thinks that the, uh, the textbooks, anatomy, physiology, and so on, they're still playing catch-up you know, with exactly what you just said. Yeah. But of course, that's, that's inevitable, isn't it? I mean, they're, they're yeah, bound is. to discover new things as we, yeah. as we progress. Yeah, absolutely. And research generally runs behind what's happening at the clinical coalface. Yeah. You know, yeah. because, you know, you're, you're working at the clinical coalface and, and then you start thinking about what you're doing and then that kind of, de you develop that through the scientific process and then that developed research which comes on behind it and by the time that research has come through, you might have moved on to something else. Yeah. Uh, Bob's actually asked whether you still use manipulation as part of your treatment. Yeah, I, I, I do, I do, but it's not really the same as, you know, it's not like a direct thrust uh, that I used to do, you know, so I used to, uh, I always used to find I'd have to adjust C5 on the left and C12 on the right. Uh, and uh, now I understand that, uh, you know, that's part of a, a quite a common pattern rather than doing an HVT at the areas where most stress and strain is, I'm much more likely to uh, um, improve the mechanics through that area by treating the uh, thoracic spine, which I would during the BA, and maybe um, adjusting uh, the uh, relationship between the occiput and the cervical spine. So we tend not to focus on uh, manipulating segments. We tend to look at arch mechanics uh, in relation to how a particular segment has managed to be doing what it is doing to see if we can take the strain off of it. And then that helps with autom autonomic balance, which is how still help people recover because their autonomic system works better and they get a, a return to normal homeostasis. I don't like the word homeostasis because it's kind of a, wherever you are is your home, homeostasis, but you know, you could be quite ill with uh, your homeostasis. So it's a dynamic thing. Have you spent most time explaining these uh, philosophies and concepts and principles to uh, conventional uh, medical practitioners, GPs or others? Yeah, occasionally when I have them in as patients and, and, and they usually get it pretty quickly. Uh, to be fair, you know, uh, they, they, they usually understand it. Because it's, it's actually common sense. You know, one of the, one of the problems I had is at, at college, and I also had this as a, as a uh, clinic tutor. So I'd be talking to you know, someone like yourself, Steve, and uh, you'd say, well, I spoke to so-and-so, so the other clinic tutor, last Wednesday, and he's saying the exact opposite to what you're saying. And people said that to me when I was a clinic tutor, and I and I thought I was quite confused about it. I under, and I understood the other person's point, and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But I was, also, my point made sense as well. And so we get a lot of uh, confused undergraduate osteopaths, not really, or really struggling with the understanding of what we're actually doing. And a lot of that is because we've taken a lot of the osteopathy out at the clinical level, because we have to, you know, we have to try and teach people to be safe. We have to teach them to be able to screen out things, but also we're trying to teach them how to get people better as well. So stuff gets left aside, and you know, the more esoteric philosophical components of it, which are actually quite important in healthcare, um, tend to get left by the wayside, I'm afraid. But I don't find medics have much, much difficulty with it. And what about the other professions, physiotherapy and chiropractic? I mean, as though they're the only other professions, but uh, they obviously... Well, they are the only other professions. Yeah, together with osteopathy, they are the key professions. And, uh, <laughs> uh, do you have much to do with them, and uh, how do they respond to what you, you say in your practice? Well, I, I think um, having been on forums a lot for the last 15 years, you know, since, uh, since uh, the internet became a thing, um, some people, I mean, I, I was converted to classical osteopathy through my exposure to people on forums. And then when I try and explain it to some people, some, they, they, they don't understand it. And, and, I, and I think it's because sometimes people re, uh, are trying to understand it from a, a, a different uh, philosophical perspective in terms of how their brain works and in terms of how my brain works. 
So I will tend to come at it from the only way I know how to explain it, and they might be looking for another explanation. Yeah. Okay. So I think that is part of the problem. So I, I, I think the biggest issue um, is is probably from within our profession of lack of the ability to be able to not lack of the ability to be able to understand. It. That's 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 not the right thing. That's not what I actually mean. But not under, not understanding it or or thinking they're understanding it and think they understand it and then think it's wrong. Because you have to uh, think a bit differently and you have to have um, more faith in. Um, nature than you would from a medical perspective in other words you know your body is doing the best it can to uh, heal itself and mend itself on a continual basis because that's what every living structure and thing does on this planet whether it be a plant a bird a reptile a fish you know your body is set up to try and uh, or strive for survival and so um, to do that sometimes we compensate in certain ways and and classical osteopathy is, is uh, or teaching classical osteopathy is a drive to understand that. So it's not the fact that we're going wrong. It's just why are we why are we doing this? What configuration do we have set up which is making our body work in this particular way? And then seeing if we can change the configuration to help that person. You talked about this earlier on, and um, you, you dealt with it fairly briefly. And Caroline has asked if you could just explain what you mean by body adjustment, BA. Well, the body, everything on the planet is affected by 1G, isn't it? So it's, uh, uh, what, we, what we tend to look at is how our structure is affected by gravity. And there will be certain areas where there's more stress and strain uh, in people's spines, like L4-5, uh, lumbosacral joints, sacroiliac joints, particularly if uh, uh, people have moved over to one side in relation to their center of gravity line, and so you get more strain there. So what, rather than looking for an area that's become rigid, is if you should put an area under strain, it would gradually stiffen up, uh, usually to try and adapt to the strain. So rather than using techniques to loosen that off all the time, and, and this is the problem I had. You know, this is what I was seeing in practice before I did classical osteopathy. Because I, I was like, okay, yeah, he's got this kind of complex uh, uh, change in movement characteristics between his L4-5 and lumbosacral joint. And what I need to do is restore normal function. So I loosen off the lumbar erector spinae a bit and maybe HVT, the bit I thought was appropriate. And off they go and they'd be more comfortable. But then it would gradually come back because I wasn't dealing with why it was like that. With, with body adjustment, what we do is we try and improve that center of gravity. So we're pushing the body back to from whence it came because we all buckle out from uh, the uh, uh, effect of gravity acting down on us. And so we're trying to nudge that back towards uh, a better relationship with gravity, which then reduces stress and strain in various areas and divides that stress and strain up through the whole structure rather than it being localised at T4 or L4-5. You know, because all that strain then uh, produces edema, which then, you know, when we're, there's enough edema there, we, we start to become aware of it. A couple of people have asked about uh, long levers. Re and Falcone have asked about it. Uh, not only why long levers, but um, what do they do that you can't do through other mechanisms? Well, the reason why we use uh, long levers is is because one of the key things about classical osteopathy is it isn't uh, about manipulation. It's about integration. So we use long levers like people's arms and legs. So you, you're, you're using a conjoint mechanism of joints and all the tissues. So not just uh, muscles, uh, bones, a ligament, fascia, but you're also involving uh, all the, the connective tissues and also the blood vessels and neural tissues as well. So you'll have a, uh, a, a moving hand and a kind of fulcrum hand. So you uh, use your lever um, as one hand and then you um, apply it through several different joints to try and um, integrate these structures together. Okay. You know, I very much like uh, one of our chiropractor viewers to tell me if they recognize any of this in, in the way that they practice. And I, and, I, and I know I keep harping on about this, but I, I love to look for similarities between our professions rather than differences. And um, it does sound very much to me like uh, the process I was just, I had described to me by um, a McTimony colleague, 
and yeah. um, I'm just interested to know if they know where, whether they their origins stem from a, a similar source. Um, classical osteopaths apparently often refer to the common lesion pattern. How does that fit in with your body adjustment routine? Um, well, that's the, the common lesion pattern is is um, a pattern that we see most commonly. So, so and, and most <laughs> most most uh, osteopaths will have seen that. You know where the the, the pelvis kind of distorts and the uh, um, right anomalous goes sort of uh, um, uh, goes sort of anterior and inferior and the left anomalous goes posterior so you get that looking at from the back you get that bow to the left through the lumbar spine and through the thoracolumbar area and up it bows to the right and uh, and then up through the through the cervical spine and you normally end up with a bit of compression up under the um, occipital atlantal Joint. So yes, we, it, not everyone has it, but quite often when you, you see someone with something else, um, if you if, if if you look at Zink's work, for example, when he had several different patterns, some of his more complex patterns, when you treat that with BA, it then comes back to the common lesion pattern. So it's often um, uh, compensation overlaid on compensation, a bit like uh, Shrek, you know, and ogres. There, they've got. Lots of uh, lots of onion skins or whatever it was there. <laughs> lots of layers, lots of layers. You know, so layers, yeah. every time you do a BA, you're usually trying to take off a layer of, of, of compensation. Did you want to say anything about this slightly more complex diagram, the the polygons of forces, even if it's uh, a little bit briefly? Um. Oh, hello. I've lost. Uh, we're just we're bringing up the slide on the full screen for the audience. Okay, okay. Well, this is what we tend to think of in terms of uh, the, the lines of uh, gravity acting through uh, someone's structure, and they, they cross over around uh, the sort of T4 area, and then the uh, AP line, which is the one at the very front of the top and the very back at the back at the bottom, uh, dissects these other two lines at about that uh, level, and there's that, that's one of the areas where there's a lot of stress and strain. Now, a lot of people get really bogged down with this in classical osteopathy, and it's necessary, really. But uh, most people who do a static postural evaluation will be using this in some way, shape, or form. You know, because when you look at someone with a kyphotic upper back, you know, you're looking at, you think, oh, okay, well, his uh, uh, lung cavity is going to be under more ten under more pressure. You know, so this this what it is, it's a a, a way of putting that information in, into physics and explaining how uh, physics affects um, physiology, really. Right. And that's okay. just as re relevant today as it was you know, thousands of years ago. Yeah. And, and again, I, I didn't want to waste your pictures. There's, um, you've no. got this osteopathic pie in the notes you sent to me as well. And, um, yeah, yeah. I guess well, this I, is, that's really what you've been talking about all along, isn't it? Integrating yeah. different systems. Yeah, so we're trying to integrate integrate everything really, and and, and that that osteopathic cake is uh, really uh, just looks at how what we do is uh, a little bit different to what people are taught at undergraduate uh, level do, where which uh, it tends to be more technique focused. I think it was um, oh Tim, who was the last GOC guy? Tim, Tim Walker. Tim Walker. Yeah. He, he, he was talking to one of my colleagues a few years ago and uh, he asked him, he said, well, what type of osteopath are you? And, and he said, well, I'm, I'm an osteopath. And he said, well, are you a, a, a visceral osteopath? Are you a cranial osteopath? Are you, a, you know, this, that, or the other? So, and, and when my colleague said to him, well, why would you ask that? And he said, well, that's how osteopaths uh, like to be um, divided up these days, it appears to us. You know, and, and so... We don't really think about that so much. We're not technique led. We're more physiology led. We're trying to in integrate physiology so we get a, um, a, a healing reaction. So then people uh, recover not only from their MSK problems but also from from other problems. Do you incorporate craniosacral or, or what the chiropractors would say occipitosacral, um, sacral occipital techniques in in your process? Well, one of my colleagues actually did the uh, did a master's degree at the uh, OCC, and so he's uh, Alex Liss. I hope I hope you're watching Alex. Alex, Alex, sorry. <laughs> and so I tend to send you know most children 
I did. But however, I do actually use a, uh, a I don't a, an involuntary mechanism approach. I was having some tuition from a chap called Chris Campbell last year, and he was telling me to slow down and slow down and slow down. And I was doing this, and eventually I started feeling this. What I most recently um, discovered is probably what Southern Sutherland called the tide. And uh, so I do use that uh, within it, but that's not really part of classical osteopathy. Classical osteopathy does do uh, a lot of work around the uh, suboccipit and the head as well, but it's um, more based on, you know, the principles that we've talked about already. You know, when I was feeling the tide, I was trying to think, well, how does this relate to osteopathy? Because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so different and feels so incredibly different than anything I'd ever felt before. Um, but it felt incredibly powerful as well. So uh, we've, got about, we've got about four minutes left, and of course now the questions are, are coming in in quantity, so we'll get through as many as I can here. Um, Jono says, we were taught long lever works uh, lack specificity and have more potential for excess force, therefore are more risky. What do you think? I would say yes, if you're not very good at it. That's, that's true. Hmm. It's okay. practice. Practice. I, I, I think, you know, if you've got a long lever, you can be more careful with something. But why would you use a long lever and have to practice harder and be more careful when you could lose it, use a shorter lever and be more specific? Well, you won't necessarily be more specific. But if you use a shorter lever, you, uh, there is a chance that you're putting more force through something. And there is probably the chance that you can injure someone even more, would be my uh, interpretation of that. You know, when using a long, long lever techniques are incredibly gentle. I, mean, I have got a link to uh, a Mervyn Waldman. Uh, video and if you want to watch some long lever techniques he is he is the guy to watch he's a he's a superb clinician oh, brilliant. well if you send it to me then we'll we'll put it up as uh, as part of the recordings page for today's discussion uh, robert uh, rebecca's asked whether you think uh, a patient who needs regular maintenance treatment is simply an indication that you've missed the main issue that's that is possible yes yeah and you have to be you have to you have to think about that you know why is this person still coming back um but sometimes it's something in their life that they can't change, even though you've identified it. And they benefit from coming back every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, three months. I, I don't have I know some people have a problem with that. I don't tend to call it maintenance treatment. I'm not sure what I call it really. I mean, I've been working at the same place for 27, 27 years now. So I've, I've, I have people who've seen me for, for years and years and years. And, uh, they come in because it makes them feel better and keeps them more comfortable. And usually if we leave them or they fall out of that routine, sometimes they, I never see them again, but sometimes a few months later, um, I do because they've stiffened up. Yeah. Um, Seven's asked whether you use visceral work, and actually I, I can see visceral motion is on your... Um, yeah, yeah, that's not quite body. visceral work, but yes, we do do visceral work, it, but it's not the um, initial... It's not the big tool. Uh, BA is the big tool uh, right. for us, really. But we do incorporate um, a, 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 a type of cranial work, which is completely different to Sutherland's. Um, however, I do my own little thing, as I was just saying. Um, so I find that really helps people's uh, uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. But yes, we do do visceral. But it's, it's not... Um, like Caroline Stone's visceral, you know, it's not at that level, right? You know, okay. An inhibition on like uh, the sphincter of body or or something like that, if necessary. I got one final question for you, very specific from Gemma. She says, "How do you treat AS?" Well, we don't treat conditions. That's the whole thing about it. We treat people. I think AS isn't always caused by the same thing, and uh, there's some people who do very well on um, certain drugs and uh, which help relieve AS and uh, that type of group of um, conditions. But there's other people who really struggle with it but, and who benefit from improving their lifestyle and uh, getting some relief that way because that uh, can help people. You know, there is always a possibility of going down what we might think of as being a conventional route in assuming that there's one thing that fixes a given I'm going to call it a condition, yeah. and actually we're treating individuals, not necessarily the, the symptoms they present with. Yeah, we're treating highly complex people.
people, you know. So so I, that's why one of the it's, it's difficult to do research on this sort of thing because you're all, every treatment you do is an experiment, you know. Yeah. So and everyone you see is an experiment. I, I quite often say this to people, and uh, and that, and they understand that, you know, because uh, once you explain that, you know, we're looking at you as an individual and uh, your kind of relatively unique pattern, even though that might be the common pattern, and uh, you know all the stuff that they do. But there are similarities between groups of people. You know, a lot of people will eat a lot of crap, drink too much alcohol, smoke, not take enough exercise. You name it, sit in, sit in terrible positions, and uh, and then wonder why wonder why things aren't as comfortable as they used to be. Yeah, I see you looking at me when you said that, so. <laughs> Robert. That's, that's uh, our time. Our time is up, and uh, thank you very much for that. That's uh, oh, a, a nice really interesting look at uh, classical osteopathy, and, and I hope other people have found it useful as well. Yeah.